This is a a special edition of the Burgess Foundation podcast in which we're exploring some of the research that's happening at the Burgess Foundation at the moment. The Burgess Foundation supports all sorts of research into the life and work of Anthony Burgess and his contemporaries. Sam Jermy is a doctoral researcher in the School of English at the University of Leeds. His current research focuses on the relationship between masculinities in the body in 17th century literature, focusing on the writing of Thomas Middleton and his collaborators. This work is fully funded by the White Rose College of Arts and Humanities Doctoral Training Partnership, who have also supported his research with the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. Sam's research at the foundation is into Burgess's relationship with Shakespeare, in particular the lectures he gave on the subject in the United States in the early 1970s. Sam, welcome to the Burgess Foundation podcast. Uh, we're very interested to hear more about your research. So can you tell tell us a little bit more about what you're researching uh, more generally and how that led you to, to Burgess? Well, more generally, I am probably quite tangential to Burgess because I'm researching Thomas Middleton, who's one of Shakespeare's collaborators and contemporaries um, who co- worked with him on Terman of Athens and Yorkshire Tragedy and revised bits of his work for performance or the 1623 folio and these are plays such as Macbeth or Measure for Measure or maybe even All's Well That Ends Well um, but then what what got me interested in Burgess from this is the idea of people doing things with Shakespeare's plays and I feel like inevitably you come to Burgess with that and I remember finding Nothing Like the Sun for the first time and just being struck by how the spoken language felt very Elizabethan and how the sonnets were used in this. So I sort of came to this project definitely more of an early modernist and a Shakespearean than a Burgess scholar. How did you find out about the Burgess lectures on Shakespeare? Well, I'm currently doing my research with the White Rose College of Arts and Humanities in Yorkshire, and they are very keen for us doctoral researchers to explore things outside of our usual projects. And so through them, uh, the International Anthony Burgess Foundation put out a call saying they were looking for someone to work on this series of lecture recordings of Burgess teaching Shakespeare at City College New York in 1973. Nobody's listened to these recordings before since they were first lectured, I suppose. Um, There's a lot of mystery about what the course as a whole may look like. And so I sort of approached them and got in contact and we had some conversations while in the Burgess archive in Manchester, all very pre-COVID and just had a conversation about what may come by working together. And so, and so here I am, and I think it's gone pretty well so far. Okay. Um, so, so you're, you're brand new to Burgess. You're, um, what, what was your experience of Burgess before you started doing this project? I have to say my experience of Burgess before this project was quite limited. I think A Clockwork Orange, reading the book, watching the film, I've read nothing like the sun and I hadn't really, I don't, I came to it sort of quite fresh in a way. So almost everything that I've picked up has been over the course of this project, like listening to recordings, picking up on anecdotes and then, yeah, so just Burgess has been completely new. Even like my research isn't even fully in a Shakespeare way. It's more on who's working with Shakespeare. So this has been quite a, an interesting pull in different directions for me. I've really enjoyed it. Um, but definitely did not come to this knowing enough about Burgess as I should have. Okay. And, and sort of coming to Burgess reasonably fresh, is in what ways is Burgess's approach to Shakespeare unique? Um, does he approach Shakespeare from an unusual angle? I think what I found most striking about the way that Burgess approaches Shakespeare is he is like thoroughly invested in Shakespeare as a like as a man and a writer, and then all of his thinking about Shakespeare always comes back to how did Shakespeare live? What were his motivations? How did he think? How did he feel? And 
so in these lectures, Burgess describes uh, thinking in terms of a series of concentric circles. And the middle point is Shakespeare and his work. And then outside of that, the world around him, his personality, what do his plays tell us about him? Just how can we discover the world in which he operated? And so what I found really interesting about his approach is this sort of painstaking detail and speculation on Shakespeare's biography. So we, we go through his childhood, his grammar school, his early contact with the theatre, his relationships with like the Earl of Southampton or Richard Burbage, his gentlemanly aspirations, his home life, and this sort of very rich picture that Burgess paints of Shakespeare that he gave to his students. It's just, it's just so, I think, textured. I think I was uh, expected from a Shakespeare course, it would be slightly more text focused. Um, but what really is striking about these lectures, and I think extends to other other writing that Burgess has done, is this interest in just in how Shakespeare lived. Shakespeare, you see, is like us. He um, He's not a learned man. He uh, He's not a man who sees life through books. He's a man who sees life directly. And his great achievement was to be able to put this direct observation of life into words. Uh, nobody else at the time could see that what they saw around them was really what we should be writing about. They all had to see it through theories. Ben Johnson had to see man through her theory of man. Uh, Shakespeare had no theories because he had no learning. All he could see was man. He was highly introspective. All he could see was himself. And uh, he was a man who was able to suffer, a man of extreme sensitivity, as is evident from these sonnets. Do you think these lectures, uh, in that sense, re- reveal anything about Burgess's life at the time? Um, does he relate his own life to, to Shakespeare's? Yeah, very, very much so. I think there's, he does it sort of one way consciously, which is that he will give details of his own life that he imagines to be quite similar to Shakespeare. He talks about writing for the television or for journalism in the same way that Shakespeare would write plays for the popular playhouses. Um, And then some of these very self-conscious ways that he gives details of his own life sometimes aren't entirely, I think, factual or accurate. And such as he describes April April and Shakespeare's life being his birth month, the month of his death, when Shakespeare's, like, I think, sister and other family members died. And then he says, and that's the same for me. April's the coolest month for Burgess because his mother, father and sister all died in April. But then that's not true either. And that's, I feel that's quite a, that was quite a game to sort of, that I wasn't attuned to coming into this, not knowing Burgess as well. And then you slowly pick on that he's sort of, this identification with Shakespeare is quite, um, it's, it's it's fictional in a way as well, and which is quite fascinating from a, a course because it's it feels like the Burgess show at points where you're learning a, a lot about him, but then it's not entirely um it's it's it's, it's staged as well. And then there's no, another way which we sort of see Burgess identifying with Shakespeare as he sees himself now as a playwright. Because at this time of the lecture that he's lecturing in New York, he's also, he only tells the students as such that he's flying off after to work in rehearsals for the musical Cyrano um, in Toronto. And then all the way up to it opening in its run at the Boston Colonial Theatre in Massachusetts. So even like listening to these lectures, you get this sense that he is quite a Shakespearean man. Oh my God, it's very difficult if you're in the theatre not to quarrel. I've just come back from Boston, where we, where last night we had uh, the opening, uh, the Boston opening of our play Cyrano, and uh, I didn't, I didn't even stay for the opening. Uh, my, my first duty was to you, anyway, to get back here early. Uh, but I didn't want to see the opening. So many quarrels, so sore. Uh, having met these people, actors, directors, producers, so forth, orchestrators, musicians, I feel so sore. The abuse that's been held to and fro. The things that have been happening on stage, without my knowledge, I feel, I feel diminished, I feel dirty. Now, um, this is a common experience in theatre at any time, but Shakespeare these with mystic somehow, because there's no record in the uh, voluminous words of Ben Jonson, whom we'll come to later, one of the greatest quarrelers the theatre's ever known, of any quarrel with Shakespeare. If, 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 uh, if Will Shakespeare did not quarrel with Ben Jonson, he'd probably never quarrel with anybody. Uh, and with that in mind, 
do, do Burgess's lectures give insight into his his work, whether that's fiction, stage, or or screen? You mentioned Serrano, but does he does he give insight into his working practices or anything like that? I think, especially in terms of nothing like the sun, I would say, because as I mentioned before, this sense that he's a working writer and he writes to make money to live in a way as well as being literary and he compares himself to Shakespeare like that and then that so that's why we he has such this large output of writing for everywhere but then on specifically I think with nothing like the sun which has as its framing device this fictional Burgess who's lecturing I think we really and even in the lectures, he quotes from nothing like the sun, uh, long passages. Uh, it's really get that sense of what that Burgess is doing to Shakespeare, what Shakespeare has done to the dark lady in Sonnet 130, My Mistress's Eyes and Nothing Like the Sun. So he uses these lectures and the novel to sort of think about truth and reality. And in terms of Shakespeare, we don't, to not think about Shakespeare as the bard as such, but Shakespeare as Will, sort of as a human like Burgess. Okay, and and you've talked about nothing like the sun, but but a novel that he wrote right at the end of his life, really, A Dead Man in Deptford. Do these do these lectures which were which took place in the in the early seventies, do do they sort of prefigure anything that's in a dead man in Deptford? Uh, I don't know anything specifically that comes to mind, but I think Christopher Marlowe, there's an entire lecture on Christopher Marlowe, which unfortunately is one of the like, the only lecture we have that is uh, only part recorded. But you, you get this real like sense of Elizabethan writers as like roisterers and sort of greedy, sort of quite real, ugly people. And I think that that feels very Burgess. From these, even from these lectures. Rather ominous name. Fraser, whose name was probably Fraser, but the name was given a Cockney pronunciation, and the spelling stuck, Fraser, Skears, and Pooley. We don't know much about these men. We know that one of them, Pooley, was a double agent. I have no doubt about that. Meaning he was uh, getting money not only from Spain, uh, but from the, the royal coffers, spying for both sides. Uh, the other two, we don't know anything about. They must have been villains. Why did Marlowe meet them? He spent the whole day with them in this inn in Deptford Strand. Uh, they had dinner, which they had about 12, 12 noon. Uh, they walked in the garden together. Uh, and then apparently a quarrel broke out. Some say it was a quarrel over a wench's honor. Others say it was a quarrel over who was going to pay the bill. Uh, but what happened was, according to the story of these three, and they stuck together in their story, was that uh, Marlowe was sitting in, um, in a corner behind a table, a table where they'd been eating. The quarrel broke out, and at one point he drew, he drew his dagger. He drew his dagger. Uh, drawing his dagger, and the stories vary here, one story says that uh, either Fries or Skeller probably grabbed hold of the hand, the struggle took place, and the dagger got into Marlowe. At the same time, another man drew his sword. One of the other three drew his sword. And Marlowe almost ran onto the sword with his head, so that the sword pierced uh, within, uh, went to a depth of three inches in the frontal lobes. Uh, the story is a mixed up story, but there's no doubt that there was a quarrel and that Marlowe was pierced with a sword or a dagger through the frontal lobes. Yeah. Uh, would you say it's a lot of it's maybe not about the characters and, and the, the environment of the Elizabethan world? It feels like that, like it's really setting a scene because um, he says that he's not, a pro he's not a scholarly professor, he's a surrogate professor. And what he seems to be a professor in is just that real richness of life. And especially with, you know, Elizabethan London that he compares to whether he's teaching in New York is sort of quite this sort of dirtiness to it, this sort of criminality and sort of sex life, it's everywhere and commerce. And I think that that's sort of really what he's sort of prefiguring in these lectures, which then 
I think it does get drawn on in a dead man in depth. Was there anything that surprised you about the lectures? Uh, I mean, you mentioned his unique uh, approach to the to the subject, but was there anything uh, anything else that surprised you? Uh, I would say this is probably no surprise to anyone who's heard Berger speak before, but just how good of a a speaker he really was. Um, because for one thing, he's quote he quotes. Shakespeare throughout and I'd assumed that he had it written down somewhere like all of all of his quotes but it um from the memories of some students and from noticing the times that you can hear pages flipping he's actually quoting Shakespeare from memory extensively throughout and it's just so impressive that is an astounding really the just the sheer amount of knowledge that he's maintained and he draws on at will to sort of suddenly bring out something from Taming of the Shrew or, or any of the sonnets and it's just this extraordinary familiarity with the text is then matched by his own skill as a speaker and it's I would really recommend trying to listen to some of the passages where he's like quoting Henry the Fourth and just very he's very animated with it and it, it, it's it just feels like a performance I think I didn't quite expect how theatrical, I mean, it, it, theatrical these would be, um, which you probably should if you're talking about Shakespeare. You should have some theatrical spectacle about you, and Burgess definitely has this. Does that all feed into him uh, being a good teacher? Do you think he was a good teacher? I've, uh, you've spoken to some of his students. But what what did they say about him? I think. From the students, there's this, because he taught the in a James Joyce class and a creative writing class as well. Burgess was one of the few writers who were hired as a distinguished professor who really want, seems to want to teach and engage with the students. He was, I think he had the writing, like the creative writing classes at his house. Um, so there's that real sense of he wants, he wanted to get to know you and help you get on your way um and he, they were quite from the former students say that they were quite impressed by how he spoke as well and being quite fascinating which is it quite contrasts with some of my thoughts listening to it because Burgess quite frequently shows it's sort of a, a frustration that sort of the American schooling system doesn't seem to have taught his students how like bible passages by heart or they don't know what certain plays were written by whom, despite the, of like, and it's just, yeah, I think Burgess's ideal student would be one who is very enthusiastic and engages with the text a lot outside of the classroom before they even reach him. So it's hard to know exactly how good of a teacher he was, but I think part of the the education you get from Burgess is to get this kind of inspiration in a way. I mean, he's a working writer. He's appearing in interviews everywhere. He's just had a Clockwork Orange release. Like part of being, that's part of the the education is having someone like that teach you about writing and Shakespeare. And I think that would be really exciting. What are the next steps with this project? Uh, how How do you hope to develop it? Well, I think the first thing to say is that the 17 recordings that I've been working on are part of an incomplete course. Um, so these lectures only go up to 1597, but we haven't even reached the Globe Theatre yet or any of Shakespeare's later tragedies. So the first, so in, in an ideal world, they exist out there, but there's no chance that, there's no guarantee that they might. Um, but then, so then the first two, there are probably two things that I think could come out of this. Um, which is to think about how these lectures fit into thinking about Burgess as a reader of Shakespeare by placing his thinking on Shakespeare as both an educator and a writer and where do these lectures fit in terms of his wider output, especially like thinking from Nothing Like the Sun to Dead Man in Deptford, how does this, how do the lectures figure in that space? I think also thinking about how the sonnets feature so prominently in his work 
because in these lectures, the sonnets are quoted the most. They're quoted from memory. And to an extent, he reads Shakespeare's biography through the sonnets. Um, so that's something also well worth exploring. And But of course, developing these ideas will probably be quite useful when thinking about the notes, drafts, manuscripts um, that are in the Burgess archive. So it's not it's not been something in a lockdown world that's been easy the easiest thing to do. Um, so I think there's actually there's a lot of space to develop this project, and I'll be, hopefully I'll have time to do it because I think the lectures are very exciting. Thank you, Sam, for joining us on the on the podcast here, and uh, good luck with the rest of your project. For more information about Sam's project and the research going on at the Anthony Burgess Foundation, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.